In the last lesson, we learned to recognize bad samples and to construct good samples. In this lesson, we're going to answer the question, what do these samples tell us? We'll start off, we'll start off with a thought question here. It's listed on your guided notes, so take a moment to read the thought question and formulate an answer, then restart this lecture again. The question that I've posed is this. To estimate the percentage of all adults who have an internet connection in their homes, a simple random sample of 1,100 adults across the U.S. was sampled and 60% said yes. How close do you think that is to the percentage of the entire country who have an internet connection? Is it within 30%, within 10%, 5%, 1%, or exactly the same? Well, hopefully you've had some time to think about this, and maybe you were at least able to eliminate some of the obvious problems. We wouldn't expect it to be exactly the same as the percentage for the entire country. After all, the country is very large, and we only have 1,100 adults. We would expect it to be close, though, maybe closer than 30% and 10% but maybe not as close as 1%, because again, this is a relatively small sample from a relatively huge population. This example brings to um, the, f the gives us an example of what we're going to be talking about in this particular lesson. Samples tell us very important and interesting information about populations if we know how to um, read their conclusions. So before we begin that, let's take a look at some important definitions. We need to make a distinction between a parameter and a statistic. Now in an earlier lesson, we learned that a parameter is a number that describes a population. We're going to get a little more detailed and we're going to say now that a parameter is a fixed number. It has a value, but that value is unknown. So a parameter is a fixed unknown number that describes the population. The reason it's unknown known is that we can't get the information from the entire population to figure out what this percentage is. A statistic, on the other hand, is a known value calculated from a sample. But the statistic can change from sample to sample. So if I were to take another sample of 1,100 adults and ask them if they have an internet connection, I might not get exactly 60%. I might get 58% or 63%, but I'm not necessarily certain that I'm going to get exactly 60% in another sample. So how are these two important values related? Well, we often use a statistic because we can calculate that from a sample, to estimate an unknown parameter. So let's see how this is done. Suppose I have the question, what proportion of Reese's Pieces candies are orange? Well, let's talk about proportion here. The proportion of a population that has some outcome or success, in this case being orange is the success, we call that P. That's going to be our symbol for the population proportion. So that would be the percentage of all Reese's Pieces candy, candies that are orange. The proportion of successes in a sample, on the other hand, is measured by something called a sample proportion. And the symbol for the sample proportion is P hat. The formula for the sample proportion is the number of successes in the sample divided by the total number of observations in the sample. So suppose I went to the grocery store and I purchased a package, a small package by the checkout counter there, of Reese's Pieces candy. Suppose it had 37 candies in it when I took it home and opened it up. So my denominator is going to be 37. I have 37 candies in this little packet of Reese's Pieces candy. If I count the orange candies, say there are 15 orange candies in there, then 15 divided by 37 would be my sample proportion for that particular package of Reese's Pieces candy. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to do in an applet that I found here. Here is my population of Reese's Pieces candies in this little candy machine. I'm going to take one sample of 25 candies, and it's going to show me that here it's counting out the candies. There are going to be 25 of them. And when it gets uh, the 25 candies here, what it has found is that 0.56 of these 25 candies are orange. So my sample proportion is 0.56, and it's plotted right here on this grid. Now, what we believe about the population proportion is that it's 50%. We believe that half of all Reese's Pieces candies are orange. 
the other half are either yellow or brown. So you'll notice that in, like my first question, the sample proportion is close to, but not exactly the same as the population proportion. Here I'm actually six percentage points away. Suppose I draw another sample of 25 candies. Well, sure enough, it's not the same as the first sample. There, 40% of the candies were orange. So it's plotted right here below the population proportion. It's a little further away. It's about 10 percentage points away. Suppose I take a thousand of these samples, though. We're looking for a pattern here. I'm going to turn the animation off so it doesn't slow us down. And look at what happens with repeated sampling. Look at that beautiful distribution that shows up. Notice that most of our candies were within 30% of the true population proportions. We had some as low as 20% and some as high as 80% when the true population proportion is 50%. So the candies are, are the samples uh, proportions are varied. They're within 30% of the population actually, of the population proportion. But look at how most of them are very, very close, that big pile of sample proportions are showing up there. Suppose I decide to increase my sample size. Suppose instead I take 250 candies instead of 25 candies in my sample. Notice that when my sample size is 25, my sample proportions are varying from 20% to 80%. Watch what happens when I draw larger samples. The surprising thing is we see a very similar shape. You'll notice that we see that nice bell shape there, mounded in the middle with a little tail on either side. But these values are much closer together. These sample um, proportions are much closer than they were originally. They're in between 40% and 60% instead of 20% and 80%. Let's summarize what this little experiment has shown us. What do you notice about the sample proportions from repeated sampling? Well, hopefully you notice that the sample proportions vary from sample to sample. They're not all the same value. But you notice that after many, many samples, we did a thousand, after say a thousand samples, there was a definite pattern to the values of the sample proportion. This pattern is called the sampling distribution of sample proportions. And we noticed that this sample had a very definite shape. It had this nice bell-shaped to it here. Tails on either side, but the majority of the sample proportions being very close to the population proportion. What do you notice about the sampling distribution? That is the pattern of the sample proportion values when a larger sample was taken. Well, remember when we took 250 candies instead of 25 candies, the sample proportions were much closer. There was much less variability. The variability of values of the sample proportion is much less when the samples are larger. This leads us to two types of errors that can occur in estimation. We can have bias in our sample um, statistics. Bias is this characteristic. In repeated samples, the sample statistic consistently misses the population parameter in the same direction. So it either consistently overestimates the population proportion or consistently underestimates the population proportion. The error occurs in the same direction. Variability, on the other hand, is this. When different samples from the same population are taken, different values of the sample statistic um, are, are, are shown or is the result. If we um, are going to use a sample statistic to estimate a population parameter, then a good sampling method needs to be used. And a good sampling method has small bias and small variability. So let's look at a visual to play with these um, terms a little bit. Here in this first bullseye, I'm showing you um, a, a target. And um, this target. Let me just see if I can get my pen back here. For some reason, um, here we go. Here is my population parameter. It's right in the middle of that bullseye. So in each one of these cases, this is what I'm aiming for, that true population parameter. Um, if, it's a, if it's a population proportion, that is the number of the proportion of 
orange candies and all of the Reese's Pieces candy. So it's a little dot in the middle of each one of these bullseyes. If my sample proportions have large bias and small variability, they're going to look like this. It's like I've missed the target in the same direction, but all of my misses are very, very close together. They're not varied. They've got small variability. In this next picture, we see small bias. There's no direction that we're consistently going. We're all over the place with our arrows here. We're missing the bullseye all over the place. And there's also large variability. Our um, statistics are very spread out. In this particular bullseye, we see large variability. There's a large spread in our sample statistics, but we also have large bias. They're all going in the same direction. They're all missing it in the same direction. And here, finally, is what a good sampling method will give us. A good sampling method gives us sample statistics that have small bias. They're all spread out all around the sample uh, or the population parameter and small variability. They are all very close to the true population parameter. The very good news in statistics is we can easily control, can, can control bias and variability. We can decrease bias by taking simple random samples instead of convenient samples. We learned that in the last lesson. We can decrease variability simply by taking larger samples. We learned that.